Hey, and welcome to You Drink, You Learn. It's episode 11, and our guest today is Clive. Welcome, Clive. Hey, Dirk. How are you going, mate? Good to be with you. <laughs> I'm very well. Thank you so much. Um, Clive is joining us today from New Zealand, and um, it's, a, it's a dear friend and um, colleague I met at Nike. And we're going to talk a little bit today about Clive's career, as we always do in my podcast. We're going to um, experience a little bit what, what made him and his life successful. Um, and I hope you're going to take some learnings uh, while we drink. And the name of today's episode, because Clive is quite a big fish <laughs> we have here today. He's a CEO. So the name of our today's episode is Take the Elevator to the Sea Level. So let's find out what we need to do to get on this level where Clive is. Clive, again, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Dirk. It's, uh, it's good to spend some time with you again. It's been a while. I think you are the first guest we have from New Zealand. <laughs> oh, very good. Maybe the first and last, eh? Sounds great. <laughs> I don't that? think so. There was uh, one person before I started recording from Australia, but he lives okay. in UK now. So um, you know how much I love your country. And um, as you also know, we always start the podcast because it's you drink, you learn with a drink. Everyone bring, brings a drink and a story connected to it. Um, and I'm going to start and I brought something you probably know because um, last time we met was actually in New Zealand. We were it was a, it was yeah. <laughs> we were in a little bar in 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 Auckland, and afterwards I I traveled through the country, and um, I had a great stop in Marlboro Country. And nice, nice. It's actually hard to get the wines from the smaller wineries um, yeah. here, but I got a a love Sauvignon Blanc. So I cloudy got, bay. I got a cloudy bay. It's a it's not a bad one. I spent some time, some time uh, there actually, and and had a couple of glasses in their, uh, in their store and restaurant and some good food. And um, good on you. That's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> it's a good choice. Uh, the the drink I've got today is not quite as exotic. It's a Barocca. You know, it's early in the morning here, so my daily ritual is a, is a Barocca when I first get up and. A Barocca is basically a vitamin drink, and it's all about mental sharpness and physical performance. So I'll take it as I can. Every morning, I have one of them. So I hope that is not a difference between you and me, what we see here. You have the mental sharpness drink, and I have a wine. So. And you're on the old soul. Exactly. Cheers. It's great to have you. Cheers, mate. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. Uh, oh, that is a yummy wine. I didn't have it for a long time. Oh, love it. Um, Clive, so good to have you. Um, we always start a little bit with your background or the background of our guest. And um, you have a crazy background. I mean, you you worked in New Zealand, you worked in retail, you moved to Nike. Uh, there's a bit of telecommunications in there and you did a lot of stuff. Can you lead us a little bit um, through, your, through your career, through your professional life? And um, if you... You're allowed to pause on any second, and if you want to, um, if you want to feature any special moment which sure. maybe have moved you in a certain direction or a special person, let us know. Yeah. Okay, yeah, absolutely, I'd love to. I mean, I've had quite a varied background. I think. I mean, I grew up in Africa and moved to New Zealand when I was reasonably young, and I always had my heart and uh, set on becoming a pilot. So I wanted to become a professional pilot. And I didn't uh, know had... that. Me as well. Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah. And I, I did my commercial pilot's license here in New Zealand and I was on my track to doing it. And I just decided as I came towards the end of it that there was opportunity for me to do more, to give more. And uh, I went back to university and studied business and ended up going down a different track. And it was the best huh. thing I ever did. And after I came out of, uh, out of university, I worked retail and ended up getting involved in a small business at the time that sold Nike products. And I'd bought into that business and together with a business partner, we grew that business over a few years and um, did my own thing with that business partner for about nine years before we made the call to move to the UK. And um, I went to the UK with my girlfriend, my, my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, and um, we, spent, <laughs> we spent nine years in the UK. And when we went to the UK, I joined Nike. So I sort of came from having my own business being more of an entrepreneur, selling Nike product and having a few different retail businesses as well as um, the Nike stores that we had and then joined Nike and um, started what was just an amazing time there. 
and that's obviously where I met you and so many other people that we've um, got good friendships and relationships with. And at Nike, I had the opportunity to move around lots of different roles and learn as much as I could and move from sales to marketing to retail, retail marketing, and just get a really amazing background. And I think that's the thing I enjoyed the most about Nike was having the opportunity to keep learning. If there was a desire to learn, there, were, there was opportunity to learn. So when we decided to come back to New Zealand after about nine years, um, for me, I was really clear on one thing, and that was what I call my personal purpose. And Nike helped us shape that. Nike helped me shape that and get clear on what was important for me and what I wanted to do to get out of bed. And when I was there for coming back to New Zealand, I knew there was three things that I wanted to do. I wanted to work in a business that was all about New Zealand. So I wanted to be in a business that was giving back to New Zealand. I wanted to be in a business that um, I could still shape and craft. So a business that was going through change. And I wanted to get into a business where I had an opportunity to build and shape a team. And the team component for me is the most important component because it's what I get out of bed for. Yeah. Now, if I look at my personal purpose, the thing that is front and center on that, the bit that gives me energy is people. Yeah. And I've become clear over the last seven to nine years that helping inspire people to achieve their dreams, helping people do more than they think they're capable of is really what inspires me. Yeah. And that's what I want to put my effort and energy into. And that's what I try and do most days. That's what I try and make sure I'm orientated around. And it's really what has shaped my career. So when we came back to New Zealand, I got an amazing role at a business called Spark, one of New Zealand's largest telecommunication businesses. And um, it was amazing. It was a business going through change, massive change. I was able to get into a team and help shape that and grow that team. But I really missed being in an industry like sport and fitness that I just knew felt a little bit different. Like I love Spark. I love the people that I worked with there. I built some amazing relationships. But technology is great. I love it in that it helps change people's lives and it helps you live a more effective and efficient life. But I'm not as passionate about it as mm -hmm. I was sport or I was fitness. So I then joined Les Mills, which is the business that I'm a part of now. And we're a global fitness provider. We provide group fitness workouts to music around the world, into clubs, gyms, direct to instructors, and now also direct to consumer through our Les Mills On Demand platform. And I've been there three and a bit years, and it's been amazing. It's back into an industry that I feel passionate about. You know, I train and work out most days. I just completed an ultra marathon on the weekend, oh, which wow. was something I've been working towards for quite a while. And I just really love those big fitness goals because I know how they make me feel and I know how they help me perform. So being back in fitness is what I'm doing now. And when I joined Les Mills, I was the CMO initially. I joined to lead the, market, lead the marketing team. And then our founder decided to step aside and move into an executive director role. And I've moved into the CEO role. And I've been in that role now for about 15, 16 months. So still early days. Had my first year leading the business through COVID, which was just a huge moment and huge opportunity so many learnings and so much opportunity to advance myself and the team. And that's what we're doing right now. And I'm absolutely loving it. It's such a good industry to be in. It's an industry that's massively impacted by COVID. You know, most of our club customers, gyms and instructors around the world right now are impacted in a really negative way. And then on the flip side, our direct to consumer business has just gone from strength to strength. So we're trying to balance both of those in a really interesting time. And for me, as long as I'm getting out of bed every day to learn, and as long as I'm being stretched and put outside of my comfort zone, which is what <laughs> I try and do on a regular basis, then I'm feeling happy. And I feel like I'm doing that right now. <laughs> well, it feels like we have a time where you don't need to do so much to get out of the comfort the zone. Comfort zone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the world is doing enough right now, I guess, to, to shake things. Um, And I think, and I think, Dirk, that's it. You know, I think the thing with that, though, is you've got to get yourself ready for that. You know, you, you can't just let it happen to you. You can't just be shaken. You've got to work out how you get out in front of it. And I, and I think that's the opportunity that we all have is how do you keep advancing yourself? Is it mindset? It's probably more mindset right now. Is it how you approach and inspire others versus the functional stuff? Because people are looking for direction. And they're looking for inspiration. And if you can't bring that to yourself as an individual, 
I think you're going to find it tougher now more than ever. I totally agree. This is why, I mean, I have so many things written down now after what you said. So people, things to go in, but um, I totally agree, especially on what you said. Um, and I applaud your work on your purpose because I, and I've said it in a couple of podcasts before, I don't believe that if you don't know yourself and where you want to go and what your values are and what you're fighting for, it's hard to get a team behind you and how to build trust and hard to, to um, get an, um, inspirational um, effect on other people, especially on your team. So if you don't know yeah. yourself and where you want to go, it's, I think it's hard to become a good leader. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. I mean, the, the, for me, the single best thing I think I've ever done is start to really get clear on what my personal purpose is. And it's what I make decisions by right now. It's what I made decisions by when we came back to New Zealand. It's why I've changed industry a few times. It's how I motivate myself. You know, back last year in April, May, in the first lockdown that we had here in New Zealand, there was a moment there where I just wasn't at my best. I was struggling. I was, um, I was very emotional. I was struggling with the pressure of work and the change we were going through. And I just didn't feel like I was showing up like I wanted to show up. And I guess the ability to be aware about that and then do something about it. You know, I know when I'm at my best and I would encourage everyone to try and get clear on when you're at your best because you then can deliberately put yourself into that position. And when you're at your best, you know, you're going to be turning up better. You're going to be doing better things. You're going to be inspiring others. You're going to be feeling better yourself. So for me, I understood there was a couple of things missing that I wasn't doing enough of. Well, and what? especially given it was, I wasn't running enough. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I know it was, sport. yeah, it was, it was, I know I'm at my best when it's early in the morning, when I've been for a run, when I'm out of my comfort zone, when I'm working with a great team, and I'm working on something big. And I had most of those components. And don't get me wrong, I was working out, but I was probably only training three or four days a week, and I probably wasn't training hard enough. Mm. So I signed up to do this ultra marathon. And mm. the reason I did that was I wanted a big ambitious goal outside mm. of work that really anchored me into making sure I really had that good balance between when I chose to focus on the family or the business or when I chose to focus on myself. Yeah. And then I told people about it and I put it out there as a goal I was going to do. And it was a 102 kilometer run. I did it just last weekend. I had to train for 30 odd weeks. I got a coach to help me through it. And it just helped me make better choices because I, I don't believe you can get work-life balance anymore. Look at how we're working now. We're all based at home. We've got flexible working. Your life just becomes your life. You only have so much fuel to give to it. You've got to make better choices. So for me, how do you make a choice when you're at work and focused? How do you make a choice when you're at home? How do you make a choice to focus on yourself? And I guess if you're clear on when you're at your best, you can make better choices. So it feels like you're not a person who, um, where, where things happen coincidentally. It feels like you're a planner, right? You, yeah, you I, I am. And I, I think some people struggle with that. You know, the feedback I get quite often is that I'm intense. And that's definitely a work on for me is how do I make sure I show up with less intensity at times? Because sometimes my intensity can be a little bit overwhelming for other people. You know, some of the feedback I've had from great managers over the years is, I sometimes set the bar too high. So what I try and work on really well is set a bar that's aspirational, but then spend your time on motivating and inspiring other people to try and get over it themselves. And I think the more that I can do that, then I show up with slightly less intensity, maybe still the same amount of energy, but I'm no less deliberate. So, so, so I, I like to try and be very deliberate on everything. And if you can do that with the right level of intensity, I think you can get a good balance. So um, I, was, I was asking that question because I was, I was thinking, because you, you said you did the purpose, it helped you to move back to New Zealand. But have you always been that way in your career? Have you always been that distinctive? And, you know, no. why did you go? Why did you leave New Zealand? Was that a career decision as well? Or Yeah, at the time, it was more of a life decision. You know, my, my girlfriend at the time, my wife now wanted to go overseas and travel. And it just felt like a great thing to do. And it was the best thing we did, you know, traveling around the world, living in the UK, living in Amsterdam, working for a global business like we did 
getting those experiences across different cultures has shaped me and has yeah. definitely given me a depth of experience that I never would otherwise have had. So it was an amazing decision. And I think for me, I would encourage everyone to do that, to experience different cultures and people, because then you bring perspective to the situation you are in. And perspective is important because I think it helps you make better calls. But in terms of leaving New Zealand to go overseas and then leaving the UK or Europe to come back to New Zealand, they were just different life stages. Mm. You know, and as we go through different life stages, we've got two young kids now, Cooper, who's seven, and Georgia is five. And, you know, we moved back to New Zealand because we've got family here and New Zealand is home. And we wanted to be in an environment where our kids could grow up with family and friends around them. Love it. And um, now that you become the CEO of Les Mills, um, What would you say during your career have been the two, three biggest learnings or experiences you had which help you in your job today? Yeah, I mean, uh, the first and, and biggest one was that moment when you realize you just can't be a single contributor. You've got to do it through others. You know, you can work hard, you can work harder, you can work longer, you can do more work to, to progress or to get things done. But at some point, it just doesn't work anymore. Hmm. And how do you inspire and build people around you? For me, that would be the biggest single thing. If I look back on my career, going back sort of 10, 15 years, I was a real micromanager. I wanted to be in the detail of everything. Oh, I would I have hated across you. Across everything. You wouldn't have and, worked you know, together well. <laughs> that level of control was something that I really felt like I needed. But understanding that you can't do it that way. You can, you can do better things. You can go much further with a group of people that are lined up behind the same thing is absolutely probably my single biggest learning. And then I think my biggest learning since then has just been how do I continue to try and be a better leader? How do I invest in myself? How do I invest in others? And it's been tough, you know, working with challenging individuals where you're trying to approach and change your style accordingly changing teams, changing environments, changing countries. It's just a constant graft. And I think if you see that as an opportunity, then I think you can position it in the right way. So I think the single biggest thing that I've also tried to be super deliberate on is language. The language I choose to use, the words I choose to use. You know, I will deliberately try and use certain words that I think, that I think positions a conversation in the right way or helps us approach a conversation in the right way. Importantly, asking the right questions. Language with that is just so vital. So yeah. those would be two things in particular that I think I've identified as being important and then continue to try and work on most days. Let's stay a little bit with your leadership style because you also mentioned your purpose, um, yeah. which is to help other people uh, fulfill their dreams. How do you do that? Do you have some examples yeah. where, where it happened um, without the, mentioning the people? Yeah, uh, I think you see it all the time. You know, a, a big part of it, I believe, is belief. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, if my purpose is about leading and inspiring people to achieve their dreams, things that they did not feel they were capable of, a massive part of being a great leader, I think, is helping people believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, as a leader, they're looking to you for direction. Yes, as a leader, they're looking for you to help them make decisions, but they're not asking you to do it for them. And most people don't always necessarily see that slight difference. And I think if you can turn it around and you can create an environment where people have belief in themselves, then you're setting them up to go on and do amazing things. And importantly, you're, you're setting them up to go on and lead other people. And I've got so Think many examples, examples of that. Five, well, uh, I mean, the number of people we've worked with where you've helped give people the opportunity to move into a new space that they would yeah. never otherwise done. Giving someone a, a small handhold to move into an environment or a role that they didn't have the confidence to do. Helping people show up differently so that they are more effective and the energy and effort that they're putting in every day actually goes somewhere and has a positive impact versus maybe having a negative impact on people. I think a big part of what I love doing is coaching. So how do you coach people to understand the outcome that they're trying to get to and sometimes the gap between where they are today and that outcome and how you help them close that gap? And Dirk, there's just examples every day. Yeah. Sometimes on a small level where you're working with an individual that's struggling or in a role, or sometimes it's in a mentoring or coaching capacity where you're deliberately working with someone over weeks and months to get them to a better place. There's been so many examples and that's what keeps fueling me 
you know, I think you see that coming right back at you. And that's the bit that gets me out of bed. That's the bit that keeps me excited and yeah. definitely keeps the fire in my belly. It's great. And it's uh, something, I, I guess, what we have in common. Um, I, I was in a conversation the other day where, where I was asked, I don't know, do you know the Big Five for Life, the book? No, I don't. Oh, it's quite interesting. It has this um, story in there where this guy or this metaphor where um, the question is, if, you're, if you would imagine you're dead and your, your, your life is a museum and it's now your job to lead through that museum, what would the pictures show which are in that museum? So what, you know, what, what would be there? Um, and, um, and my answer was pretty similar to yours because it, it's not that we, I don't know, bet Adidas in market share. When I, <laughs> it's, it's great that we did. Um, it's, it's not that we you know, became a 1.3 billion market. It's great that we did and it felt good, but that's not, that's not the picture in my museum. The, the picture in my museum is the letter I got when I left my last company from people um, where I made a difference, where I said something I can't even remember in one meeting or you know, in a one-on-one -on -one, um, or where you know, we, we gave a challenge or a task and it helps someone to grow. So that is something which, which feels, where, where I totally agree, which feels fulfilling. Yeah, I, I think something that someone said to me once that's really stuck along the lines of what you just talked about and making a difference or making an impact in people's lives is quite often- a positive one, hopefully. A positive one, exactly, is how do you make sure you have more positive moments? And I think something that someone said to me that stuck is this notion of quite often we might go into meetings where we're meeting with a group of teammates. And for us, it's just another meeting in our day. But for the people in that room, it is the meeting, the most important meeting in their day, maybe even their week. So how do you make sure as a leader, you're showing up and making a positive impact that inspires them? to go on and have an amazing day or an amazing week. And I think if you can show up with that frame of mind is I want to have a positive impact today. I want to make sure sometimes I'm going to have tough conversations, but having a tough people conversation or a tough conversation about something can always be done in a way where you lead people to a better place. And that's not always easy, but if that's your intent, you're going to get there more often than not. Sometimes the place is also without the comp uh, outside the company. Definitely. And, you know, you, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think there's a lot of change that people are going through right now that lives in that space, you know, whether it's been forced change because of the impacts we're seeing around the world or whether it's personal change because someone just decides that what they're doing and the business that they're at or the job they're in doesn't quite line up with their personal purpose. They want to make a change as a result of it. And I think that's why I'd encourage everyone to spend the time to try and get clear on what gets them out of bed. And then importantly, when you're clear on that, how do you help yourself show up in the right way more often than not? Sweet. I have to come back to the CEO part because you took the elevator up. And um, when you're saying, you know, you're trying to help your teammates or people around you to fulfill their dreams, I would guess that, you know, I, I have been a GM, sim a little bit similar maybe than your role. Um, I don't know how big is Le Mills. How many people do you have? Uh, we have about 550 people around and, the world. Uh, how many directs do you have? Um, I have seven direct reports. Okay. So we talked a lot now about how you make a difference. And it, it feels like, you know, those people you have the one-on-ones with, you have um, the chance to influence through a meeting where you sit together or you, I don't know, you have a, a Zoom or conference or something. Yeah. How do you bring that level to the 500 people um, around you? You can't talk on a daily yeah. basis. Oh, no. Most about, it's something I've enjoyed most about this role. And, and what I mean by that is in, in this position, there is a responsibility. There is an accountability to make sure that you really help deliver clear, consistent communication in a way that's easily transferable across the business. So exactly as you've just said, you know, a big part of this job is about broadcasting, messaging, communicating, making sure that you're super consistent in the message you want to permeate across the business. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to become a CEO. It's, it's less about the title. It's more about the opportunity that it has provided me to have an impact on more people left and right across the business, to learn different functions 
and to start to really look left and right across a business and be able to have an impact on how a business is tracking and some of the decisions we make. And that's what I'm loving about it is in this role, I've got to be really clear on how I communicate. So yes, you can have direct one-on-ones with your direct team or maybe your, your closer team. But beyond that, it's quite often in a broadcast type style where whether it's all-in sessions that we run on Zoom or what we call Blue Jeans, and we have the company across the world dialing into it, whether it's written communications, whether it's informal communications through more social type channels, your language has to be consistent. Your messaging has to be consistent. And you can't just say it one or two times, you've got to say it multiple times. And bringing people with you, I think is one of the biggest opportunities in this role is how do you bring 550 people around the world with you through other people? And if you were deliberate on that, and if you put time and effort into that, it can be done. And don't get me wrong, Dirk, I'm struggling on a lot of these things. I need help on a lot of these things. It's not something that you just do once and you get right. Mm. My conversations with my direct team, some of them are advanced and some of them are in the early stages in terms of, am I making an impact? Am I helping them be better at what they do? And I would say yes to some and I'd say no to others. And I think a big part of being in this position too is understanding that it's okay to get things wrong because you set the tone and the tempo for the business. And if it's okay to make mistakes and if it's okay to ask for help and you can set the tone for that, then that's very much what permeates across the business. So you're in a position here where you've got people looking to you for direction. I think you're in a position where you've got to inspire. I think you're in a position where you've got to help build belief in the organization and everyone across that organization. And then you just do your best job of getting out of bed every day. I think something I talk about a lot is this notion of attitude as a choice. I think we can choose our attitude. And yes, things happen around us that put pressure on that or push us into areas maybe we don't necessarily want to be. But if we turn up choosing the right attitude, understanding we want to make a positive impact today, generally the outcome is going to be better for it. Have you been able, I, I, and I still, again, I applaud that you you did this purpose work. I think it's so important um, and it makes you a better leader. Have you been able to translate it to the company? Not your, your, just yours, but now as a CEO, you're able, I guess, to form and uh, help crafting the company culture, the company oh. values and the company purpose. Um, so that your you, your directs and and everyone within the company comes with a certain attitude style. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a, there's a few layers to that. You know, I yeah. think the first is I try and encourage people to do personal purpose work on themselves all the time. And whether that's my direct reports, whether that's the business, anyone who I have an opportunity to talk to about it, I would encourage them to do it. And I share mine. I share mine openly, because I come from the space of trust. I give trust unearned. I'll trust everyone. I'll come into a situation where I'll share my personal purpose and I'll create an environment where hopefully if they're up for it, they can take something from it. So that's the first bit. The second bit to answer your question around Les Mills and our personal purpose or the purpose of the company is one of the reasons I joined Les Mills was it already had a very strong purpose. You know, so our mission is to create a fitter planet mm -hmm. and we want to do it through life-changing fitness experiences. That in itself is really resonates with me. Creating a what a wonderful planet. mission! <laughs> yeah, healthy people, healthy planet, and everything we do revolves around that. So yes, we sell group workouts, fitness workouts to music, choreographed to music, but at the heart of it, it's about getting people moving. It's about getting people active, and now more than ever with this pandemic, we know that fitness is such an integral part to mental and physical well-being. So the purpose of the business has an opportunity now to shine more than ever. So I haven't had to work very hard on that mission of our business. What I do have to work hard on is making sure that we translate what we do into an environment where more people can choose us and be a part of it and getting more people active. Um, let's talk a little bit about the business because um, I, I knew you guys from my gym around the corner because there are yeah. uh, uh, a lot of courses uh, happening. 
Um, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great gym, I guess, <laughs> if they offer your courses, because you've probably chosen them. H how does your business work? What is the business model? How many yeah. gyms and trainers we, um, do you have? We, we have, yeah, we, so, we, so we're in 25,000 gyms around the world. Ooh. And um, we have Les Mills instructors that train and teach people on Les Mills classes. And we have 130,000 instructors around the world that are Les Mills instructors. 130,000. 130,000 instructors around the world, yeah. And those instructors would normally teach in those gyms. Obviously, times now are totally different where instructors and clubs, gyms are challenged, really challenged, which is one of the hardest things that we've had to deal with and will continue to deal with. And then we also have a direct to consumer business where we sell our product direct to consumers through a Les Mills on demand app. So it's app based like Netflix and Spotify. And it's a people subscription can choose service. subscription service. Yeah, monthly subscription service. So that's really the opportunity. And um, our business has gone through a lot of change in the last 12 months, like most businesses around the world. We've had to go through change that has been very good for us. And we've had to go through change that has been very painful. And the painful change has been regarding people. You know, we've had to make choices over the year where you've had to say goodbye to people that you otherwise wouldn't have wanted to say goodbye to. Mm. You've had to make choices over the year where you've had to make decisions for the benefit of the whole business versus the benefit of a few individuals. And that's been tough. It's been really, really tough. So I think from that perspective, the last 12 months have taught me a lot. And then on the flip side, there's been a lot of opportunity in terms of markets that it's opened up, uh, environments that it's created, and the ability for us as a business to advance ourselves. So we've innovated like hell over the last 12 months. We brought new products to the mix. We've got all of our training now online. We've gone online with all of our training, something we used to do only face-to-face. -face. We've brought new products to the table to service clubs, to keep them open, to help them stay connected with members if they've been forced to close digitally. We've provided live streaming options for our instructors. We've, we've brought a lot of product to the mix and we've innovated in a way where we want to see what opportunities might help us bed some of that product in. So what we've now done is we've got a business that looks very different, hmm. a business that looks totally different. And the opportunity we've got as we go into our next year is how do we now make this next year our year of transformation? And it's going to be a year of transformation for us if we can actually take some of those innovations that we've done and start to lock them in and actually make sure that they turn up as meaningful changes for the business. So yes, we've got a wide network of clubs around the world that choose our product. We've got a wide network of instructors around the world that teach our product. And we've got a lot of consumers now using our product direct. But what's interesting with our business is the sweet spot is where we're able to provide an integrated fitness solution, whether you want to choose to work out at home, whether you want to choose to work out when you're traveling, in your local gym, or whatever it might be, is because we offer products and services that let you choose those regardless of what your circumstances are. So the year has been huge for us, Dirk, and mm -hmm. will continue to be, no doubt. But then at the same time, it's forced change that has gotten us to a better place. So my present to you is a time machine. You jump in, you jump out in three years time. We hope COVID is over and there is also new, new COVID. <laughs> How would your world and the Les Mills work, uh, world look like? What, what would have changed? What is your, you know, what would you love yeah. to see when you jump out of this time machine? I think, I think the biggest ask I'd have for the team and of myself is let's refuse to return to what was. You know, I think there's so many people that have a desire to go back to what they did. Mm -hmm. And that's because of habit or that's because it's comfortable and that's what people wanted to see. But at the end of the day, that's not an option. So if I go forward two to three years, where we will be is we have locked in this change that we've been through right now and our business is better for it. So we're having better relationships with customers, better conversations with those customers as a result of it. We've got rid of things in our business that were slowing us down and holding us back. We flattened our organizational structure. We're making faster decisions. We're inspiring people in a way to do it. 
and that's what it's been like and we've moved forward in a positive way are you moving um is the direct to consumer part um the way for the future or a, a, a part which will be probably stronger through COVID? 100 yeah our, our direct to consumer business has jumped forward four years hmm. and we believe that that's just the start of it but what we've also seen because in new zealand it's a slightly different environment is it can bring and does bring more people into fitness and therefore gets more people into gyms so we've seen in New Zealand that, yes, people might have taken up digital fitness, they worked out at home, they might not have been active beforehand, or they might not have been a member of the gym. And then when gyms have reopened, they've chosen to not only keep working out at home, mm. but they're also now going to the gym. So you get this hybrid solution, this hybrid environment where you choose to work out at home and at the gym, which is what most of us do anyway. Totally. So exactly. It's customer behavior it was happening beforehand. I think it's just slightly further heightened right now. Yeah, I think it will be just more organized because companies like you organize themselves better so that this hybrid model for, for consumers will be better working because in the past, it, it was everything was a little separated. Totally. And, and half working. And I'm a consumer, so I love to do a digital workout and I do it at home now because I have to. But yeah, as soon as possible, I want to go back with other people live also in a workout. So, yeah. um, and both will stay. Both will stay. I, I think the live environment will be more important initially, actually. You know, I think in New Zealand, because we're living a slightly different life right now where we have a lot more freedom than around the world, is what we saw is people just really wanted to get back into environments where there was social connection. You know, at, at the end of the day, we're human. So, The social connection component of it is what we get out of bed for. We crave that. We crave that relationship building and having environments where we have other people around us. So when you get given the opportunity to do it, that's what you jump back to. And we've seen that here. And something you just said that really resonated with me is because is I believe the same, which is digital fitness is actually going to help the fitness industry advance, I believe, because Like I just said, we, we're humans, we crave social interaction. And if you look to the music industry as an example of it, we know that digital music is widely accessible now. But before COVID, the demand for live music festivals were at all time highs. They were selling out around the world. People just loved it. So digital music has brought more people into music as a whole. And as a result, driven demand for live experiences. And we think digital fitness can do the same for live fitness experiences. You have a very unique proposition as a company with the DTC part, but also with the courses and the trainers worldwide. Who's your competitor? Who's, what is your competition? How would you There's describe so many. it? I mean, I think anyone with an iPhone at home can be a competitor of ours. You know, at the core of it, we, we produce fitness content. Yeah. So our product is content. We're content creators. So anyone that wants to produce fitness content is a competitor and you don't need to go very far to jump on Instagram and to see <laughs> lots of that. So at the heart of it, we're trying to make better content every day. We're trying to really invest in our content. We're trying to make sure that the content we produce is fit for purpose, not just in a live environment, but in a direct to consumer environment as well. But then there's also some big competitors like Apple Fitness just launched fitness, Peloton. You know, Peloton is a global player that's just going from strength to strength, connected fitness environments. There's so many. From what we see, though, we're one of the few that really helps bring the clubs and gyms, the instructors and the consumers together in a way where the sweet spot of all three is an ecosystem that people are just craving for. And if we can play in that space really well, we offer a really unique proposition And that's what we're focusing on. So you know, I think competition is good because it forces you to lift your game. It forces you to get sharper and make better decisions. I think competition is good, especially when someone like Apple Fitness comes into the market is because it also lifts the awareness of more people who weren't actively working out beforehand to get working out. So it grows the pie. It grows the category. And then if we can take a bigger piece of that pie, while the competitive set continues to grow, then we're winning. And we need to make sure that we're showing up in the right way to do that. 
and have the best possible product. And if it's content, I guess the quality of the content for you is core. How do you keep with that many trainers also? I mean, it's super interesting to me because yeah. as you remember the old days at Nike, you know, we had, uh, it, for example, in our Berlin store, we had a little uh, gym and uh, just managing this one gym, <laughs> getting hard. the right trainer, yeah, getting yeah. the right courses, making sure people show up, they, yep. they pre-order slots, you know how it is. Um, yeah, it's tough. But, but how do you keep the quality of trainers Uh, to a great level how do you keep the quality of your product worldwide with such a big audience uh, top notch yeah so we we set high expectations we invest in new product every quarter at a high level and then we're producing direct to consumer product every week mm -hmm. we have master trainers what we call program ambassadors program directors here in new zealand that set the intent and the bar for that program for the product that they create and that they teach. And they set the standards. They change the workout consistently to give variety. They make sure that their trainers around the world and the network of trainers that teach theirs are measured accordingly and given new training skills on a consistent basis to upskill themselves. So there's continuous education, continuous education to do that. And there's continuous reinvention of the program or of the product so that it's changing on a regular basis. And therefore people need to take the time to upskill themselves, to learn the new moves. Something we also do is we backed by science. So all of our workouts are scientifically tested to deliver results and motivation. And we know that those are two key tenants that are important on why people choose us. So we're investing and innovating in our products on a regular basis, not just to advance the quality of the product, but also to advance the quality of the experience that is delivered by the instructor or trainer, or even the customer experience that you might have through our app or through other touch points that you have with us. So it's just a, it's a constant process in terms of continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. And we are always refining that. Sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong. But at the end of the day, you know, we've been around now for 50 plus years. We've got good experience and good systems in place. And yes, as competition comes in, it lifts, uh, it lifts the pressure slightly, but it also creates more opportunities, which we're excited about. That's great. Um, when you, um, we, have a, we have a lot of listeners who are at the beginning or in the midst of their career, you know, and they're, um, they're seeing you as a very successful CEO. What, what would you give them as a, as a hint or as a tip on their way through their career, what to focus on or what not to do or any, any recommendation? Yeah, I think the key thing is I'm learning every day and everyone is learning every day. And if you put yourself in an environment where you're getting out of bed to advance yourself because you're hungry to learn and you're hungry to put yourself out of your comfort zone, opportunities will come your way. You know, things have always happened that are great for me when I'm out of my comfort zone. <laughs> when I'm feeling comfortable or not really feeling like I'm pushing myself as hard as I can, I'm, I get bored. And what I've found is if I deliberately put myself out of my comfort zone more often than not, that's when great things happen. So my advice to others would be is be open to learn, be hungry to learn, and importantly, put yourself out there on a regular basis, because when you do that, that's where you're going to see the biggest shifts. So what comes after an ultra marathon? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's tough. Eh? It's, uh, it's, it, it's something that I have thought a lot about because I didn't want to come to the end of it and then have nothing to go on to. So I've taken this week off. I haven't done any training. I mean, the run was 102K, so it was long. And I trained for 30 odd weeks. So it was a, it was a long journey to get there. But it just went fantastically. It was one of the best things I've ever done. It was definitely the hardest thing I've ever done. And it taught me so much. It taught me so much personally. I did it personally. I did it for personal reasons, which was, can I put myself out of my comfort zone? And how am I going to respond? You know, what am I capable of? People talk about resilience, but I don't think you truly learn resilience until you really stretch yourself. So it was a big part of that and just seeing what I'm capable of. And I've signed up to some other events. I've got an event in April, a half marathon here in Auckland. I've got another event in June, which is a, 
a trail marathon um, high on the North Island. So I've got a few other big events. I have actually thought about doing another Ironman. I did an Ironman back in 2011, so 10 years ago. So while I'm a little bit older, um, I'd probably approach it quite different. And I'd love to give that another go and see if I could beat my time. So there's a few things bubbling, Dirk, but I think what I have learned is having these big goals outside of my professional or family focus is important for me on a personal level because it helps me be a better human. And I know that I need them. So I'm going to lock something else in that's big and audacious because I know it will help me sharp right. Well, two things. Um, well, thanks for sharing, first of all. But two things. Um, in our last episode, we had uh, a guy called Mario Konrad. He's the founder and CEO of a small German company called Ryzen. And they okay. are um, a, a tri triathlon um, company. Oh, triathlon. Yeah, yeah triathlon awesome. Company. And Frodo is actually part of the company. So oh, and wow. their, their um, goal is to... Um, well, they have he always hated the style of of um the outer outerwear right uh, quality oh, yeah, so they okay. they, they yeah. just build a new standard and a really good looking one so let wow. me know if you're doing that i can i can maybe help connect me get... totally and i can look good while i'm doing it which is <laughs> sort of, part of, it, of my and performance the, and the second one we can we can also talk about later um my, the family of my partner, they have a house next to the Zugspitze, which is the biggest mountain in Germany, half Austrian, half on the German side. And on the Austrian side, they have this run which goes uphill. It's a very, very tough run because you have different um, temperatures. Um, okay. yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's a, I've never done it. It is definitely not for me, but it sounds like it could be something for you. So I might yeah, say, yeah, I'll give it a go. When we can travel again, that might be yeah. something that's very nice. <laughs> not for a little while, I assume, but uh, I would love to be able to do that. Yeah. I, I just think these things are important. You know, the thing I love about fitness and sport is why I loved working at Nike as well is you're, you're often around people that are just really pushing themselves in a way that, you otherwise wouldn't have got experience to observe. You know, you can see how really people get peak performance, the best performance out of themselves. And there's a lot you can learn from that. I think it's something that sport really brings to the top. And that's what I love when I choose to do an event. It's the environment it's created, absolutely. The social interaction, definitely. But the ability to push yourself or to learn about yourself is what I get out of it the most. Sweet. Uh, Clive, we're almost at the end. Um, I started this podcast um, because actually, and we talked a lot about social interaction, because I was missing social interaction. I was missing the bar talks. I was missing the, the, the energy and the inspiration I get out of this. And I actually wanted to inspire my network to talk more, to go yeah. on a Zoom, to, collabor to collaborate and uh, work together. So I think you gave them some great, great hints. But my last Fantastic. question is always about the network. Um, and I always ask my guests, is there something in your life right now, an obstacle or um, a topic, something where my network could help you um, to get over it? And vice versa, when should people out of my network contact you? So what would you have to offer to, to a bigger group? Well, I think on the first one, in terms of is there a problem I'm dealing with that your network could help? I think the problem would just be is in, in a CEO role, it can be really lonely. You know, you can be in a position where you don't necessarily feel like you're getting much support or interaction. So if there's any people that have listened to this that have shared similar experiences to me or feel like you've got something to share, I'd ask you to please get in touch because it can be really lonely. And I would love to get some advice and guidance from people, anyone around the world that thinks they've got something that could help me move forward. On the flip side, I would encourage anyone to get in touch with me from your network. If anyone wants to talk about personal purpose, that's the thing that gets me out of bed. I'd happily share mine. I'd happily share how I've got into mine, the changes that I've made over the years, because it's been something that's been in the making for seven years, seven plus years now. And I would happily share how I've got to where I, where I am and some of the important components of it. You know, one of the things we didn't talk about on my personal purpose, there is a, it's everything's on one page, but there's a second page and it has a quote on it. And the quote says, we are the ones that we have been waiting for. And mm -hmm. there's a big story behind it if you wanna go up and read it, but we are the ones that we have been waiting for. And what I love about that is this whole notion of don't wait. 
don't look for someone else to give you the answer. Don't look to someone else to solve your problems. You've got the solution within your own hands. So if you put that into effect, and if you're someone that's listening to that today and that resonates with you and you want to get in touch, then the invitation is there. There couldn't be a better ending. Thank you so much. Um, folks, everyone out there, check out Les Mills on their website. Uh, they have great trainings uh, digitally. Check them out um, before we all go back into the gyms and can do it together uh, physically. Clive, thank you so much for being with us this morning Pleasure. from New Zealand. I hope and I pray I can be there very, very soon. I want to have a beer again. <laughs> very good. Thanks for the chat. It's been lovely and um, really good to talk again. Have a great day and all the best uh, for you, your family and your company. Take care. Cheers, Dick.